Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Primary Care Improvement Portfolio, introducing our Autumn Winter Support Office offer conference call hosted by Jill Gillies. My name is Leslie, and I'm the event manager. During the presentation, your lines will remain on listen only, and if you require assistance at any time, please key star zero on your telephone, and a coordinator will be happy to assist you. You may submit questions on the WebEx via the chat. Um, to do this, just click on the chat, and please ensure that you send to all participants. And I'd like to advise all parties that the conference is being recorded for replay purposes. And now I'd like to hand you over to Jill. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you, Leslie. Hi, um, and welcome to this WebEx this afternoon. My name is Jill Gillis. I'm the Portfolio Lead for the Primary Care Improvement Portfolio, um, and wanted to just thank you for taking the time out of busy schedules to join us this afternoon. Um, can you move to the next slide, please? So, in this WebEx, we're, we're, we're going to provide the opportunity for you to hear from frontline staff who have been inter implementing a number of the interventions that we're going to discuss this afternoon. Um, you'll have an opportunity to contribute to a panel discussion. Um, this panel discussion has been led by national leads with colleagues from across primary care services um, and Scottish Government. So really good opportunity for you to get some of those questions into the chat box for that panel discussion. We hope it is an opportunity for you to learn how you can access support from the um, improvement advisors within the primary care improvement portfolio portfolio, um, and again, have that opportunity to ask any questions within the chat box and also to put some comments within the chat box. So very much a, an opportunity to share and learn across what we're all doing within primary care services. And next slide, please. And the next slide is an outline of what we're going to cover within this agenda. So um, I've just done a wee bit of that sort of scene setting. We'll, we'll hear from a number of presenters in and around why we're focusing on these three key interventions. We'll have an opportunity for that panel discussion, and then we'll outline how you can access some of that support if, if you're wanting to connect with those improvement advisors. Next slide, please. Um, so, so what is the areas that we're focusing on? So um, around about two months ago, we undertook an extensive review with our stakeholders to identify what we um, we'll call our Improvement and Service Redesign Support Offer. We wanted to focus on those areas that were of key priority to the service over the winter in the midst of this pandemic. Um, and so we've paired back a lot of the activities that we normally do in supporting quality improvement and service redesign within Healthcare Improvement Scotland. And we've paired that right back to focus on supporting um, care navigation. And, and that care navigation is linked very much to um, the, the, the public messaging and, and, and the communication toolkit that's recently been produced and shared by Scottish Government colleagues. So we'll, we'll hear further in and around that support offered in relation to care navigation. Um, we're also looking and focusing support on serial prescribing. So a number of you may know we were actively supporting a pharmacotherapy collaborative and looking at a number of the different interventions in relation to pharmacotherapy. Again, we have paired that right back and we're looking at how we can maximise and shift as many patients as, as safely possible onto serial prescription. So we'll, we'll hear again in and around the why of that and the how. Um, and, and the third area is around about anticipatory care planning. And, and again, we'll hear some really good examples of um, good anticipatory care planning conversations and how you can access further support and resources in relation to that. So we're going to hear from um, three key presenters um, who are actively working in, in relation to these three interventions. Um, if we can move to the next slide, please. Um, I'll introduce all three presenters, and we're going to start with um, Andy Sloan, who's a practice manager um, from a practice within Edinburgh City Centre. Andy will then hand over to Elaine Payton, who is a senior prescribing advisor within NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. And Elaine will then hand over to Dr. Andrew Mackay, who is a GP um, within Edinburgh City Centre also. So um, without further ado, I shall now hand over to Andy, who will um, take the, the mic. 
Thank you, Jill. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andy Sloan, and I am the practice manager here at the Meadows Medical Practice here in Edinburgh. I have been asked today to provide you with a quick presentation to our team experience of successfully implementing care navigation into our practice over the past year. So, why implement care navigation? Well, the benefits to patients are gives people options to access the care and information which best meets their health and social care needs. Helps them to see the right person at the right time and at the right at the right place and at the right time. Sorry, creates an opportunity for a person-centred conversation. Next slide, please. What were the benefits to us as a practice? Well, from our own perspective, we decided to embark on this project as we were seeing an increased demand in our appointment system and a growing awareness of GP appointments being wasted on patients who could have been appropriately seen by another healthcare professional. And also the realization that we were already care navigating to some degree. This fact was particularly useful, especially at the start of the project when we were trying to reassure and encourage some of the more reluctant members of our team. We started this project in December last year with great support from the team at Healthcare Improvement Scotland, and we were making good progress up until lockdown. Before lockdown, we would say the biggest benefit was that the project did bring our whole team together to work on something that we all knew would benefit us all and our patients. We also found that we started to build closer working relationships with our other local external healthcare professionals such as community pharmacists, opticians and dentists, which has been a real positive. After lockdown, we would say that the main benefit of re-engaging with the project was to see all of our planning, hard work and whole team efforts finally being put into action. Next slide, please. So what were the barriers? Well, these were for the practice, limited staff confidence and skills, and time available for setup. And for patients, reluctance to share personal details, lack of awareness of alternative services, changes to practice access during COVID-19, and digital exclusion. And the next slide, please. And what were our enablers? Well, from a practice perspective, this was strong leadership and endorsement, knowing when the time was right, doing just what we needed to do to implement the project, and a willing and engaged team. And from a patient perspective, this was clearing, clear messaging in a range of materials, reassurance and supportive approach when asked for details, and investment and investing the time to help them understand. Next slide, please. What are our top tips? Well, honestly, I would say go for it. I know we are all very busy at the best of times, and so understandably, I know we could all easily put these things off for another day. But we also all know that that quiet period we crave very rarely arrives in our world. The tools and support provided by Healthcare Improvement Scotland are excellent, and I'm not just saying that, they really are. We found that you are guided through the project step by step from start to finish. We found it so straightforward that we have already taken the decision as a team to use the same tools to implement the document workflow admin role into our practice, and in the last month we are making some great progress. Additionally, I have policies, protocols, team PowerPoint presentations and more, and I have already said to the Healthcare Improvement Scotland team that I am more than happy for these to be made available to anybody who wants to use them and adapt them to your own practice. I am always on the end of a telephone or email if anyone would like to have a wee informal chat about our experience also. As I say all, go for it. You will find that the positives do far outweigh the negatives. I sincerely wish you and your teams all the very best with the project. Thanks very much, everyone. And I will now hand over to Elaine Patton. Hi, thanks very much, um, Andy. Um, as, as Andy said, my name's Elaine Patton. I'm, uh, Jill introduced me earlier on, but I also have a joint role as a secondment with Scottish Government as the National Project Lead for the Medicines Care and Review service, um, of which serial prescribing is, is one of the, the main components for, for MCR. Um, we started looking at this piece of work with um, his, within the Pharmacotherapy Collaborative um, about a year ago, and uh, it was one of the, the work streams that we were looking at with practice within that, that collaborative, but unfortunately got caught up with 
um, as, as lockdown and um, COVID-19 sort of changed dramatically how, how we work and our focus of work. So his have now um, decided with us um, within the collaborative to continue looking at serial prescribing as a, as a single piece of focus. And I think that's been really important because of the, the learning that we've had over the, the last six months around the benefits of what serial prescribing can offer, and particularly during the, the pandemic and especially planning ahead of what the second peak might have, have looked like for us all. In terms of why do we want to do that, um, the benefits for the patients have been kind of fairly well documented over the past few years. This in itself is not a, a new service, but it is a new way of how we deliver serial prescribing. I've spent quite a, a, a number of times of talking and listening to all stakeholders and, and making the changes so that this is, is should be far better and more slicker a process than what it was previously. For patients, it's really around about um, it's a more person-centred care. It's about putting them in the middle and about giving them the choice around what type of prescription they can get in collaboration with their GP and, and practice team, but also the community pharmacy as well. And it also gives them better um, access to, to improve pharmaceutical care, to ask questions of their community pharmacy teams around their medicines and, and any issues that they might be ex, um, experiencing. But in the main, for patients, it's about improving the patient journey and improving their access to the medication, which then has a knock-on benefit for the, the other clinicians that are involved in the patient's care. Can I have the next slide, please? So for those other healthcare professionals, by improving the patient journey and um, improving their access to medication, it's got a knock-on benefit both in the, the practice but also the community pharmacies around managing workloads. And that was a big thing for us at the start of the pandemic. And, and how did we avoid that coming into the second peak for both general practice and community pharmacy for managing the, um, the influx and the high demand for, for medication that we saw at the end of March, early April. Because a serial prescription is in place um, for such a long period of time, it can be in place for 12, uh, six to 12 months, we've got um, the ability to reduce any medication errors. Um, and we know that by reducing medication errors, we can have an impact on hospital admission as a result of, of drug-related medication errors. And taking all of this into to consideration, you know, the, the, the big win for, for us is in how we practice is about creating capacity because we can plan our workload a lot better. And for general practice teams, it's about moving the management of the repeat prescription process away from general practice um, to community pharmacies and with only a request to, to do it when the serial prescription comes to an end at the end of the, the 24 or, or 56 week time period. Next slide, please. So for me, the, the big enabler for this has been the decoupling of the patient's registration for the service. That was a that was a big barrier um, under the, the old model, and we we took that away about a year ago, and it's had a real benefit to how we deliver um, serial prescribing now. It also means that if you're looking at which patients might be suitable, you're actually starting with your whole practice list. Um, there, there are some exemptions, both legal um, and therapeutic um, and pharmaceutical, so that a patient might not get a serial prescription. But in the end, it's not restricted by the patient having a registration for the service um, already in place. One of the other main enablers is that the service very much encourages the use of, of PRNs and when required medicines onto a serial prescription. And that in turn has benefits for reducing the amount of waste that we might be seeing and also has an added on benefit of helping to contribute to managing the drug budget. And the next slide, please. We know that new ways of working, and this is a new way of working, can be um, difficult, can be challenging right at the start. Um, and I'll come back to that in, in a wee minute. Um, but it, it, like, as Andy was saying in the, the previous chat, if you stick with it, it does get easier. 
The patient selection is absolutely crucial. It, it works as an enabler, and certainly the work that we've done in Glasgow and Clyde over the summer, where we've had a rapid implementation, is showing that if you choose your patients well, um, for those that might be suitable for serial prescription, it, it does help the whole process flow a lot better, but it can become a barrier if it if it's the wrong patient that becomes selected. So it's very important that we have those discussions with our patients, but also with all the staff that are involved in the process, both in the practice and in the community pharmacy, around this new way of working and what that means and what what the prescription looks like and how that works and things like that. A couple of things just to kind of draw your attention specifically to. While patients who use a compliance aid or a DUSET box, it's, it's called a various things, are not technically excluded from having a serial prescription, we don't encourage it because of the practical challenges that it covers. So if you're looking to develop serial prescriptions, um, please avoid those patients that, that use those monitored dosing compliance aid type um, of, of devices. And also, currently, patients resident in a care home are currently excluded from the service. So we, we can't, at the moment, um, include them, but there's work ongoing um, to, to see how that might look like in the future. Go to the next slide, please. So my top tips for you, um, this is a collaborative piece of work. I, I would strongly encourage those that are working within general practice to discuss um, and involve their practice-based pharmacy team, but also the community pharmacies, if you've not already done so or not already started with this. I mentioned about starting from your whole patient list and then shrink down. There are tools within the Scottish Therapeutics Utility or STU that can help you do that. What I would encourage you to do is don't think small. Don't start with those patients that are on one or two repeat medicines, because experience has shown that we struggle to then move upwards from that. Start middle of the road. Start with patients on four to five medicines and get used to that. It builds up confidence in the process. It builds up confidence in what's happening. And the more you do, the easier it becomes. But as I said before, you know, it's, it's important to engage with community pharmacy teams. And they may well be having patients that they've identified as suitable, but, um, and they should be considered as well. So it's not just all about general practice, and it's not all just about community pharmacy. It's about working together for a more person-centred way of, of helping patients access their medicines. And the more you do, it does become easier, um, and the benefits are, are become more evident for everybody that's involved. So I'd like now to, to pass over to Dr. Andrew Mackay, who will take you through the anticipatory care planning. Hello, everybody. Um, so, yes, I'm Andrew Mackay. I'm a GP in Edinburgh, but also GP advisor on anticipatory care planning to the Edinburgh Long-Term Conditions team. I think there's never been a more important time to hear the voices of patients, to understand what is important to them, and to ensure that the treatment is in keeping with their wishes, because that is really what the heart of anticipated care planning is about. Um, it helps counter the assumptions made by others, and by so doing prevents inappropriate interventions, but also we're now seeing it, that it prevents inappropriate lack of interventions because that voice of the patient is clear. Next slide, please. Um, so, benefits for care services and clinicians. Um, so, it allows the right treatment at the, in the right place, reduces distress from inappropriate care, both for the care services and clinicians, but also from, from the patient's perspective. Um, definitely saves time through sharing of information, and it has been well shown that it saves resources through reductions in inappropriate care. Next slide, please. So enablers, um, we need to target the right pre people. So how do we do that? Well, there's lots of different ways we can identify people who might be good candidates for an ACP, PRISMs, H, uh, high health gain patients the shielding lists most recently, and frailty scores, but also um, events, so after hospitalization um, or arrival in a care home, 
Um, these are all good reasons why people need um, an ACP. Um, we can't do ACPs for everybody um, because if you did, so f for myself, if I had um, ACPs for all my patients, it would take me 500 to 600 hours of work a year just keeping them up to date. So we need to target it, and there's various tools around to help us do that. Um, you need to make the plan before a crisis happens. So if you wait till a crisis occurs, then that is not a good time to have an ACP conversation. The best time is always before that crisis. And so doing, you can do it in a relaxed and comfortable manner with a far lower degree of panic than will occur during an actual crisis. Use the conversations guides like REDMAP. REDMAP is a system designed to help take people through the conversations involved in, um, in creating an ACP. These conversations are sometimes not straightforward. Some people aren't ready for them. And the guides like REDMAP um, do, do help you get ready for the conversation and do all the necessary um, scene setting um, to create a shared understanding of what is important to people and how they see their health developing before you start talking about what interventions they might and might not want to do. If you go straight to the end and just say, do you want this treatment or that treatment, you're much less likely to have a, create a decent ACP and much more likely to upset people. Um, there are various ACP processes around, like seven steps for ACP in care homes, which has been widely used in Lothian and, um, and elsewhere. Um, and the um, respect process is, again, uh, an, an ACP process. Um, the KISS is, has got lots of um, issues with it. It's, it's far from perfect, but it's what we have at the moment. Um, um, but looking ahead, the National Digital Platform um, will hopefully address some of the barriers that I'll be coming on to speak about now. Next slide, please. So the biggest barrier about creating ACPs is time, because although it does save time in the long run, it takes time to do. Um, and also, in many instances, the, the time that we spend in primary care doing ACPs predominantly benefit secondary care, and the time they spend in secondary care cannot doing ACPs can sometimes benefit mainly primary care. So it's, it's an, you're doing it for the future and for others, um, and sometimes people don't prioritize that as much as they could do. Um, I've mentioned keeping it up to date. An out-of-date ACP is not great, and it can be quite confusing for everybody. Um, so you do need a system for keeping it up to date. Um, with KISS, only the GP practices can do the updating. Um, with the National Digital Platform, that will change, but for the moment, it's only the GP practices that can do it. Um, it's no good creating one if it's not used, and we need to ensure that it's used during a crisis. In the early days of ACPs, there wasn't much engagement with it. In secondary care, that has changed, and the secondary care colleagues absolutely love ACPs. Um, and they're frequently berating me as to why not everybody that comes through the door has one. Um, so it, it is valued by the people who should be valuing it. Um, but in the community, we just need to make sure we remember to use it. Um, in the ACP world, there's lots and lots of different local projects and local bits of work that are being done, perhaps not with as much sharing between um, enthusiasts as there could be. Um, the training options for having ACP conversations are, not, are sometimes not great. Um, uh, there are, they are out there, but they're perhaps underutilized um, and underfunded. Uh, next slide, please. So top tips, um, engage everyone in your team. Uh, KISS is in particular often seen as the, the remit of GPs, but actually anybody in the practice team can and should be updating the KISS. Um, everybody in the hospital team who is having conversations with people about their care should feel able to contribute towards the plan. Um, engage with other teams across the primary secondary care divide and um, 
between different areas, between different silos and uh, within primary and within secondary care. We have a variety of projects in Edinburgh about um, engaging with um, the carer support organizations, with community respiratory teams, with mental health teams to try and get them to um, contribute information towards a creation of a high quality KISS. The um, Effective Communication for Healthcare website is, um, is a, an excellent resource for those who are looking to enhance their skills with anticipatory care plan conversations, and um, I would recommend it to everybody. Thank you very much. I'll now hand back to Jill. Okay. Um, thank you all for, for um, delivering those really insightful presentations. Um, I have lots of questions um, are coming through in the chat box. I've been trying to theme them, so we'll, we'll, we'll definitely get to all of your questions and all of your comments we'll certainly address after this. Um, I'm now going to hand over, though, to our panelists and ask them to give them a bit of an overview for their panel um, discussion. So I'm looking to introduce Fiona Duff, who is a senior advisor in the primary care division. Then we will look to hear from Kirsten Castles, community pharmacy development pharmacist from NHS Worth Valley. And then we will hear from Dr. Paul Bone, a GP in Dollar, um, who is also the National Clinical Lead for Palliative and End of Life Care. So I'll hand over now to Fiona. Hi, Jill. Oh, I was wondering what photo of me you were going to use on this slide. Thanks for that. <laughs> um, I can hear a B pain as well. I don't know if anybody else can. Sure, but I won't. Um, okay, I don't know if we can stop the B pain, so I'll just keep going. So first of all, I just want to say thank you to Andy for um, his presentation on um, how he's introduced care navigation in his practice team. It's really great to hear um, the benefits to both your practice and to patients of introducing it, and, and your enthusiasm, Andy, was infectious. I um, also want to say a big thank to Jill and to Lindsay and the team at HIS who um, took something that was a little idea that I had about three and a half years ago and have turned it into this amazing resource and network and success that we've got across Scotland and the fact that we're now able to offer it to every GP practice in Scotland, um, I'm just absolutely blown away by it and I'm incredibly proud of actually. So thank you, Jill and Lindsay, especially for all your help and support for that. And I think it's been the first time that we've really done something nationally that supports particularly the role of practice receptionists um, and the, the role of practice managers as well. But the receptionist role is very much one that is underrated. It's not always appreciated and valued. It's a very difficult job and they get a very hard time. And at the moment, we know that they're particularly dealing with um, quite anxious, quite stressed, and at times quite rude and aggressive patients. And we know it's, um, it's not easy. So a big thank you to you and to them for all of the work that you're doing at the moment. We know general practice is busy and we know we're going through challenging times at the moment and things are very different. We know patients are anxious and worried and we know that there's lots of mixed messages out there. My own mother-in-law told me the other day that her GP practice is closed because the doors are locked. And when I tried to explain to her that, no, no, you just need to phone up and you'll get to it, the, the look of this place that I got was quite interesting. So despite hearing how busy practices are, there is still a perception out there from some patient groups that practices are not open and not available. And that worries me that patients who really do need help and support from general practice are maybe at times not accessing the help that they need. Um, so we, we do need to think about it. And part of that is to make sure that patients can get the right care at the right time from the right place. And that's where care navigation comes in. So how do we do that? Um, Lindsay's going to update you a bit more on the care navigation work, but I just wanted to flag up the primary care communication toolkit that we issued to practices last week, and I hope you've all seen it. In that, there's a range of resources for general practice, one of which are the links to the new NHS Informed Community Services page that we've developed. And one of the things that we have put on that page is an explanation for patients around the receptionist role and why receptionists are asking patients the questions that they are. We know from user feedback we did um, earlier this year, the end of last year, that patients don't be like being asked by a receptionist, can you give me an idea of what's wrong with you? But in order to do care navigation properly, in order to do the telephone triage that many of you have had to introduce, those conversations need to happen. 
So there's resources on there to try and help to explain to patients why receptionists are doing that. But again, it's something for you to think about within your practices, within your teams, about how are your admin staff doing that? What kind of things are they saying? Again, we're hearing anecdotally and patients being told things like, oh, we don't do face-to-face -face appointments anymore. Now, that's not true. We know that's not true. But what it, you mean is we have to have a telephone triage consultation first. Then there'll be a conversation about whether you need a face-to-face. -face. So we really need to think carefully about the messages that we're giving patients. We know what we mean with this messaging, but we need to think carefully about how patients are hearing those messages. So on the NHS Inform page, as well as information about self-management, about NHS Inform, about the role of receptionists, there's also information about the other services, about community pharmacy, about dental and optometry. And again, I would encourage you to look at them, and to, um, particularly for your reception staff, to use them as a training resource to really understand what services are currently available from dentists and optometry. They are back to full service. It might not feel like that, but they are operating a full service. And also, we really want to promote and push the pharmacy first. That's been a, quite a soft launch in July. But over the next few weeks, we're doing we're going to be doing adverts in uh, local papers and other things to really promote pharmacy first as an option for patients um, before they go to their GP. So again, those kind of things we would like to encourage you to think about as part of your introduction of care navigation in your practice. But as I said, please think about your messaging. Please think about what's on your websites, what's on your voicemails. You know, are you still your voicemail saying we're only dealing with emergencies when actually you're dealing with kind of a broader range of things? Put yourself in your patients' shoes, particularly your frail, elderly, and anxious patients, and think about what they are hearing from some of the messaging. I know you're having to manage demand. I know it's really busy, but how to get that balance right is a real challenge. And therefore, please utilize these resources. Um, Lindsay will explain to you a bit more about how his are going to be able to support practices to do this. Um, but just to echo what Andy said, please go for it. And thank you, Joe. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Fiona, we now hand over to Kirsten. Thanks, Jill. So I thought it might be helpful just to give some updates um, of some of the work that we've done in Fourth Valley with regards to serial prescribing. Um, so historically, we did have little pockets of activity, but um, they didn't necessarily quite get off the ground for various reasons. Um, and so recently, we have um, done some work to revisit this, um, particularly um, in light of the uh, COVID pandemic back in March, where you know we knew that patients had um, had some real issues um, accessing medication and the volume of prescriptions that community pharmacies were expected to deal with in a very short period of time. Um, so we have managed to upscale quite quickly um, in a couple of practices, and the work has really shown us that as practices get to around about that 10% um, of their patient list size, the admin staff, the GPs, and the community pharmacies um, are all starting to, to notice a benefit to their workload. So for the community pharmacies, it's about being able to manage their workload. Um, and for patients, it's definitely about that easier patient journey and access to medication. We're going to start doing some, we've already started to gather some anecdotal feedback um, from our GP practice teams and our community pharmacies um, around about the benefits that we are noticing um, as our numbers of serial prescriptions increase. And that's something that we intend to do in a sort of two monthly interval um, over the next six months or so, as um, practices grow in their number of serial scripts, so that we can we can then monitor some of the trends. So we're asking GP practice staff, you know, just simple questions about how they are, uh, you know, how much time do they feel that they deal with an average dealing with repeat prescriptions, um, and whether that's changed or not in the sort of like three months following. Um, we're also going to ask them about, you know, how much time do they um, spend dealing with queries um, relating to repeat prescriptions, and um, as serial prescribing numbers grow in the practice, does does that change? And um, so that's some of the work that we're doing. We're also starting to do some work around about encouraging the interventions that pharmacists should be making with each medication collection. Now we know that lots of patients um, will take the opportunity to ask their pharmacists questions when they're collecting medication. And I certainly think that CO prescriptions makes that even easier for patients. Um, but we're just starting to think about actually what content do we want to put in the treatment summary reports that then go back to the GP practice at the end of that script. 
um, and what information is beneficial to, to all parties that can be captured within that. We found that fee subscribing works really well where there's a good relationship between the community pharmacy, the GP practice and the pharmacotherapy team working within the practice. So we're taking a cluster approach um, and have started in an area where there's close working relationships um, between sort of one or two GP practices and a small number of community pharmacies. Um, we're utilising training documents in our shared care agreement, which we've adapted from the national shared care agreement, and making sure that we've got open communications right at the start and um, before we even start thinking about implementing serial prescribing, so that everybody's clear on simple things like the prescription lens. Um, the types of patients that um, could be considered for serial prescriptions um, and, and actually patients that maybe are not as suitable for serial prescriptions. Um, and because we're working in clusters and areas where there are good relationships, we've said that the shared care agreement can either be between a GP practice and a community pharmacy or they might want to actually agree on a cluster level as well. Um, and as Elaine had mentioned in her presentation, communication is really key to the success of this, so making sure that we've got good communication between the GP practice, the patient, the primary care pharmacist, um, and the community pharmacy to make sure that everybody understands the process um, and making sure that our patients are informed and they understand what's happening um, and they know where to go if they've got any questions. So that's probably all from me. Okay, thank you very much, Kristen. And if we now hand over to Paul. Hi, thanks, Kristen. And hi, everyone. Um, so we heard from Andrew Mackay about why anticipatory care planning is important and the various enablers and barriers that exist. And Andrew's local experience in Lothian is backed by a growing international body of evidence that indicates that good ACPs lead to beneficial health outcomes with people feeling valued and listened to. But this won't and doesn't magically happen on its own. To support good ACG conversations, we need to consider and plan how we incorporate it into busy general practice. And also how we work with others within the hospital and community settings to share the responsibility. There's been a five-fold increase in the number of key information summaries just this year. And currently 20% of the Scottish population now have a key information summary. So this is testimony to the hard work within general practice at the start of the pandemic. But I'm now finding it quite difficult to keep these up to date, let alone thinking about creating new ones. So personally, I'm delighted that ACP will be one of the key primary care work streams supported by Healthcare Improvement Scotland. I think this work will allow teams to start to consider how we identify those patients who might benefit most from an ACP to learn about how we start these conversations in a positive way um, that engage people and allow us to tackle topics such as DNA CPR sensitively. I think it will help us to discover what tools are available for patients and professionals to support ACP and also where to find them. It will help us to develop robust systems for sharing and updating care plans through the key information summary and also to explore the development of new digital tools, such as the Essential ACP and Respect. So in summary, I think anticipatory care planning is important because it's person-centered. It leads to better outcomes for our patients. It's not going to happen on its own, and it needs a structure with dedicated time and sharing of responsibility. And so it's timely for the primary care and treatment portfolio to focus on this topic and to provide support in the months ahead. So back over to Jill. Okay. Um, thank you all very much for that overview. And lots of questions in the chat box. I think there is a little bit of bleeping. I thought it was my phone. So I jumped off and come onto my mobile. Hopefully you can all hear me okay on my mobile. If not, do let me know and I'll, I'll try and sort something there. There's a lot of questions. I'm thinking if we maybe take this in a themed way and we perhaps pick serial prescribing first and um, perhaps Kirsten um, and Elaine can, can be on hand and, and maybe Leslie from the team in relation to answering some of these questions. So if I call a few of them out and then you can consider how you want to, to address those. So we've heard from 
Sue Perkins has talked about, a lot of the benefits have been identified for serial prescribing. She's interested in how these have been measured, quantified, as this information would really help with the scale and spread. So, so do we have data around about this? Um, question for Elaine. Finding time and practice to change people onto serial strips has been a barrier in my practice. This is from Carol Holmes. How did you overcome that? And then a question from Andy. Can admin staff identify patients for serial prescriptions? And if so, do they need to discuss each one with a member of the pharmacy team? I'm going to just carry on. I'm hoping you're noting down some of these questions, but you can let me no, know. No, I was just trying to remember them. <laughs> okay. okay. I'll do one. I'll, I'll do. I'll do. I'll do one more. There's a few from Ed. I feel like I need to get one of Ed's in there. And um, so, so Ed's asked probably the golden ticket question: What's the time scale for electronic prescribing? And um, he's also asked in and around community pharmacists are getting a wee bit fed up with phone call prescriptions. As GPs do more remote cons consulting, can we know? Longer hand out can, can no longer hand out scripts, so so they get phoned. What's the solution here? So so a few ones in there. Um, where would you like to start? Benefits. Yeah. So the, the benefits and the data that was asked. Um, we know we we don't have any kind of quantifiable data that I can direct anybody to to go and read or or have published any data. Anything we have is around anecdotally. Um, but it's it's one of the things that I'm, I'm hoping that the collaborative work that we're about to launch next week um, you, under the pharmacotherapy collaborative will be. But we will be collecting some data that we will get something a wee bit more robust that we can share on the on the back of that. What we do know from some of the work that we had earlier, and again it's anecdotal, um, and Kirsten mentioned it earlier. There's around about the 10%. Patient um, list, or the, the number ten percent of your patients on your practice list size moving on to a serial script, is where the general practice team start to notice a benefit in, in their workload. There's there's less um, stuff to do around the repeat prescribing thing. So, but again, that's not written down anywhere. Really sorry, but um, it is something that we probably do need to do as a national piece of work, uh, but not at, at the moment. Mm -hmm. So can I? I was going to say, can I just jump in there, really? And so, just in terms of the collaborative, we are sort of going to be tracking the the patients um, transferred onto serial prescriptions, but we're also going to be doing that as a percentage of of the patients on repeat, so that we can try and identify those practices who who perhaps hit that ten percent, and and try and get some qualitative data from them around what that workload feels like. What we're also exploring at the moment is actually there is one team that's looking at printing costs and times that it's taken to print their um, prescriptions and, and what that would be in time savings and cost savings um, if you extrapolated that up in terms of serial prescribing. But we're, we're going to be working um, exploring that with a, a health economist to see if, if that's going to be useful data. <clears throat> Okay, thanks, Leslie. And um, there was a couple of calls, a couple of questions there around who can identify patients. Um, it's not exclusive to the the clinicians or the healthcare professionals to identify patients. We do recommend as part of the process that there's at least a level one medication review done before the serial prescription is actually produced. Now that can be done by not a trained non-clinical member of staff. Um, but if you plan to do something more clinical in terms of medication reviews, certainly if the admin team identify potential, potentially suitable patients, it probably still needs to go through the pharmacy team or the, the, the clinical, the medical nursing team for suitability first. Um, so it, it's definitely not an O. It is very much a collaborative full team effort. Um, and yes, the more people that have got eyes on this and understanding and get to a feel for what sort of patients groups would benefit, the, the better. I did see an awful lot of questions popping up around electronic um, prescriptions and the need to um, do away with, with wet signatures. I'm not aware of a time frame as yet, but I do know that Scottish Government are starting to look at it, and it certainly has been a big, big pressure. 
um, and lots of questions been asked over the summer as a result of the pandemic. Whether that will speed things up, I don't know, um, but certainly moving to serial prescribing, while it's not paper less, it certainly helps you move towards a paper light type of system. Um, Fantastic. Yeah. Sorry, Aline, did you have did you want to come back on one more? Yeah, there was something about phone call scripts kinda of coming through. Um I, I think that I, I hear what you're saying and we certainly try and kind of look for different ways of, of doing things like that and it would certainly encourage whoever had asked the question to maybe contact the community pharmacy leads at their at their own board to find out how they're doing it locally because, you know, as a practitioner I, I don't find phone you know, phone calls adds to everybody's workload, and um, so we have explored other ways of, of doing it. So I would encourage people to, to double check in their own health board what those arrangements might be. Fantastic, thank you. And I realise we're not going to get through half of these questions. We will produce a Q and A after this, so we'll capture all the questions and we'll provide a bit of a, a Q and A summary after this. I'm going to do go to ACPs next. So look for Andrew, and Paul, and our improvement advisor Tom, and then we'll do care navigation, which will lead into Lindsay's presentation. So we'll make sure we give a, enough time to that care navigation piece. So a couple of questions in this and from Ed come through finds that secondary care input for ACPs emailed and copied and pasted usually needs editing, it's too long, tries to aim for around Twitter lens. How can we work better with secondary care in ACPs? Then he's also flagged in and around, obviously, after sort of first round disaster, the first wave in and around DNACPR and some of the stories we're all aware of there. These discussions have become easier. I think in the pandemic has focused the attention for many patients in this regard. And um, he's also heard that a DNA CPR can be electronic without the paper. Is that true? Also, a question: Do we still need individual patient consent for kiss? And Diane Faulkner has asked: Is there any data to show the benefit of ACP kiss from out with the practice? I'm sure how routinely it's been accessed from colleagues out with the the practice, for example, community nursing teams. So I will leave those questions for the panel to come back on. Hi, it's Paul here. I'm happy to start. So um, yes, in terms of you know ensuring that we get concise information back um, from secondary care that we can you know put into the key information summary we, um, quite easily. There is work at the moment going on to. Um, develop digital ways of collecting information that encourages the information to be quite concise. There's something called an essential ACP that was developed um, at the beginning of the COVID outbreak, and there's work going on to digitalise something called RESPECT. RESPECT stands for um, Recommended Summary Plan for Emergency Care and Treatment. And this, um, these digital products encourage um, the, the clinician to enter more concise information and it's easier to transfer to the key information summary. I think the second question was around the consent for the key information summary and there was an agreement at the start of the pandemic from RCGP and the Chief Medical Officer that um, explicit consent was not essential before um, completing a key information summary. That's still in place at the moment because we're still in the pandemic, um, but it does need to be revisited again next year. I think you know the premise is it's still good practice to get consent before adding information to the key information summary, but a lack of consent shouldn't be a barrier to providing good care and to sharing essential information. So, you know, I would I would hope that you know that can be revisited again next year with with further clarification. And I think the last bit of the question was around, is there any evidence that um, key information summaries um, are, are viewed or seen? And there is actually, there's, there's data that's collected by NSS in terms of the number of accesses to the key information summary each day. And there are literally thousands of accesses every day across Scotland to the key information summary, predominantly from out of hours, from NHS 24, from emergency departments, to a lesser extent from the Scottish Ambulance Service. Um, and community nursing um, teams, some of them have access to um, the key information summary. Many don't, and I think it just shows the um, frustrating um, vulnerability of, of our um, primary care um, 
IT systems that, that, that we don't talk to each other particularly well. But I think it's an important area. And I think the development of the new digital products, such as the digital respect, will be a way to make it easier to share information between um, community nursing teams and GPs. Andrew, do you want to add anything else to that? Yeah, just on the, the consent issue, um, obviously there's a, a very large number of kisses created without consent in the spring, um, and it may well be that that, that um, when, they, when that was done, the understanding was that they would be withdrawn once the pandemic was over, whenever that might be. So for all practices, you need to think about how you're going to identify what, what you're going to do about that. Are you going to try and get consent for those people? Um, over the, um, you know, over the next six months or nine months or whatever it is, um, and and how are you going to recognise that you have gained consent? So at our practice, we're putting special notes in for everybody that we have gained consent on. So we'll be able to search on those cases created without consent that don't have a special note, and those are the ones we would delete. But I think that, um, there are discussions about whether consent will still be needed, but um, most people have shared the information on the basis that um, they know, you know that they have, um, most people share information because they, uh, they're confident that, uh, about how it's being done. And so um, the other, question I wanted to come in on is the ACP data for um, for those who are outside primary care, so the community nursing and um, et cetera. I'm, I'm actually not aware of specific work on community nursing or other um, community services. There's a lot of evidence about ACPs collected by care homes and care home staff. Um, and uh, including some of the stuff that we've done in Edinburgh. Um, but th th I don't see any reason why the, where the information is collected would make any difference to the huge benefits in terms of um, reduced time and resources that you see with doing uh, ACPs just because of where that information came from. So I, I'm sure that it, that data would be positive. I just don't have um, – I'm, I'm not aware of any. Thank you. Uh, and Andrew and Paul, thank you very much for that. And, and apologies to, to cut you short there. I'm really mindful we're pushing the time here. Um, what I'm going to suggest we do, um, Lindsay and Fiona, there's a number of comments in and around the, the serial prescribing. So Diane Faulkner has asked if there's a structured program being delivered that practices can join such as PASS. Well, we're about to tell them about what the, the, the opportunities are there. Um, Jennifer Towell is, would welcome a copy of the materials Andy has offered and highlighted probably the biggest um, hurdle is getting buy-in from the staff. Um, how did we overcome some of those things? And also, Fiona herself has highlighted she's interested in Andy's comments that it's important to invest time in helping patients to understand care navigation. How did you do that in his practice? And, and, and a couple of comments in and around patients and, and navigating and battling across that primary secondary care interface and how are we alleviating those things happening. What I'm going to suggest is we move to the next um, slide, which is Lindsay Wallace, our improvement. Um, who is leading on the care navigation work, and who's going to give an overview of what we're doing in support of care navigation. And Lindsay, I'm thinking you could possibly pick up one or two of those points within your overview. Once we've heard from Lindsay, we will also hear from Leslie McFarlane, one of our improvement advisors, who will outline our offer of support in relation to serial prescribing, and she'll then hand over to Tom McCarthy in relation to ACPs. I'm really mindful I'm talking really fast because we've got to get through lots. So over to Lindsay. Thanks, Jill. Thanks so much. And um, thanks to everybody for all the um, really relevant questions that have been asked around the Care Navigation Work Program, um, most of which will be answered in my uh, formal um, uh, uh, broadcast to you just now. So. Um, as part of our COVID-19 response, the Practice Admin Staff Collaborative, which we more affectionately refer to as PASC, um, 
has had to review its priorities over this um, uh, this current time of the pandemic, and we made the strategic decision to really focus on facilitating during these extra challenging times the scale up of safe and effective care navigation processes in general practice across Scotland, which is what Fiona referred to earlier on that we're taking a whole Scotland approach to this piece of work. Um, the aim is to support practice teams everywhere across Scotland to either set up or review their existing care navigation processes. Uh, and to support that, what we've rapidly done over the past couple of months is developed a care navigation in general practice 10-step guide, which is essentially a how-to guide uh, on how to set up um, uh, care navigation safely and effectively um, at pace and scale. The guide itself includes um, a series of key information and access to supporting tools and resources in one concise and we hope very accessible format. Um, the guide is also intended for GPs, practice managers and the, and the admin team members um, and really encourages the whole team to work together to build their care navigation pathways collectively um, along with members of the in-house multidisciplinary team and also with local and external partners and that really emphasises that need um, which questions have been raised about, about the, the need for building relationships um, and investing the time to help both staff and team members understand um, what the pathways are and how to signpost safely uh, to other services and professionals, but also to help patients understand because it is a significant change in, in the way we work and function. Um, the guide also draws connections with other key national resources and how they link together as well. So, for example, Fiona also referred to the Pharmacy First um, campaign, which was uh, relaunched and launched in July this year. Um, and the guidelines are available for general practice, and they can be used to develop bespoke practice navigation guidelines for admin team members to help them understand and be able to signpost effectively. There's also within the guide... Um, uh, information on how to access support from gp.scot um, to set up practice websites for those who haven't yet had the capacity to do that already and signposting to the extensive range of public messaging resources in the newly released primary care communications toolkit that Fiona referenced earlier. Um, the guide is also accompanied by a series of hour-long virtual workshops which will be delivered from the 2nd to the 15th of December and access to follow-up group sessions in January 2021 for participating practices who value an opportunity to ask supplementary questions after the workshop and would also benefit from sharing their experiences with other practices to enhance their learning and progress. These coaching sessions will be supported by our subject matter experts who I want to give a big thank you to for the development of this resource, Fiona McGurr, Louise McCallum, who are both on the call today, and also Anne Ribay, all three practice managers um, within um, practices in Scotland at the moment. Finally, throughout the delivery of the workshops, we'll also be collating a frequently asked questions document, which will be regularly updated with answers to questions raised during the program. And all these resources have been developed to support practices as efficiently as possible during these challenging times and are intended to help practices make best use of their limited resources while continuing to improve outcomes for patients, families, carers, and the staff. The guide will be circulated along with a registration link to the workshops in the coming days, and we very much look forward to engaging with you and, and as many practices as possible across Scotland over the coming weeks and months. Thank you for listening um, to my pitch and I'm going to hand over now to my colleague Leslie McFarlane. Sorry, I was still on mute there. Uh, thank you, Lindsay. Next slide, please. Oh, no, not keep it. So uh, I'm going to keep this short and sweet. So um, as Elaine has mentioned before, we had started a pharmacotherapy um, collaborative in the end of last year, which we had signed up with several GP practice teams to work with around that, which then went into hi hibernation. We have re engaged with those pharmacy teams, uh, those practice teams. And what we intend to do probably from now until the end of January is actually to explore with them what the um, existing resources are. Elaine has mentioned, you know, the medication and care review resources that are available online. But we're also aware that there's lots of teams have started implementing serial prescribing. And what we want to do is take the learning that they've experienced and the tools that they have. 
so that we can kind of pull them together in a, a, a toolkit that's a one-stop shop for people um, who want to implement serial prescribing. What we want to do as well is do some rapid testing of this with those collaborative teams to ensure that it's implemented in a safe, planned and structured way so that in a year's time you don't get that tsunami of reviews all at once. Um, so we want teams to think about how, what are the processes for implementing and identifying patients. We're going to support those teams with QI support through uh, uh, several workshops um, and be supported with our faculty teams. We're going to develop some case studies and then by the end of January we hope that we'll be able to um, schedule some webinars and workshops at a national level so that we can share that learning across Scotland. So that is my pitch at the moment, and I will hand you over to my colleague, Tom McCarthy. Hi, and good afternoon. I'm really aware that we're really out of time, so I'm going to keep my section really short, even shorter and sweeter than Leslie. Um, so anticipatory care planning has actually become part of the primary care portfolio at the start of October, and we've been developing our plans um, based on the work that's been underway elsewhere in his previously, but thinking about what we need to do in the current context. And one of the things that we're really aware of is that the information on ACP is not easy to find in our website, so we're currently in the process of doing some work to make it easier to find the information that you need. We will be sharing the links to the essential ACP that Paul talked about, also some of the dementia ACP guidance that's been circulated by the Chief Medical Officer as well, and those links are on this slide, but we'll make sure you get those after the WebEx. Uh, but as, as we go forward, we'll be making sure that that website's really easy to find that. And as part of that is making sure that we are showcasing the best of what Scotland's already doing and sharing that learning um, so we're developing a series of case studies um, and if people have ideas about things that they would like to be profiled in that please do get in contact um, and after Christmas so in the early part of 2021 we'll be holding one of the resilience webexes uh, focused entirely on ACP and we'll be sharing our newly relaunched website um, and what works and the work that's going on out there and bringing together a whole range of people from across Scotland. The focus of what we've been doing today has been supporting COVID and that COVID resilience work. So there has been a, a huge development in a whole range of materials um, and we've continued to refine those and make sure that they're packaged up and easily located. Uh, the first part of that is what you can see there on the key link. Um, Paul, who you heard from earlier, has done a slight update to the essential ACP, so you can access that from the website and see that. Um, and really looking forward to working to you on all of this, but I'm going to hand back now to Jill. Okay, thank you. Next slide, please. So uh, apologies that we're run slightly over. As you heard from the team there, the next for us is hosting a series of workshops um, in and around those areas that have been outlined. The, the key workshops will be in relation to the care navigation. Those are the sort of first workshops that we're going to be running and they will begin on the 2nd of December. They're going to be an hour long and we're going to run it for multiple times over multiple dates. So you'll be able to drop in at a time that is convenient for you and we will do similar for ACPs and the serial prescribing but we're going to start with the, the care navigation navigation and the 10 step guide is already available on our website. Next slide please. Um, the next slide is a plug for our Resilience WebEx. The next one is on the 1st of December, and we run these in collaboration with the Scottish Government and RCGP, and the um, one on the 1st of December will be hosted by Carrie Lunan, and we'll be discussing um, working across the interface. And as Tom said, then our six WebEx we're hoping to host and focus on ACPs, and that will be in early 2021. Um, next slide, please. That leads me to really thank all our presenters 
Ministers for take, giving us a fantastic overview this afternoon and also to thank all of you for taking the time to join us this afternoon. We will send the links to all of the resources that have been discussed and also the links to how you can join those um, workshops and participate in the activity that and the, the key kind of areas and interventions that we've outlined. And, and we will do a bit of a Q&A summary from the chat box and share any resources that you've shared amongst yourself within that chat box as well. So thank you all very much and have a great afternoon. Thank you, Jill, and thank you to all your speakers. And thank you, everyone. That concludes your conference call for today. You may now disconnect. Thank you for joining and enjoy the rest of your day. Right.